I looked in the mirror every morning. Heavy makeup, skimpy clothes from the junior department. I would gulp down gallons of coffee, swearing at the poor souls unlucky enough to be at the breakfast table with me. Who is that woman, I would think? Why is she acting like that? When you've spent your entire life as a good girl, you don't suppose you'll change quickly and completely as you near age 50. I've been a pretty boring person. The extent of my wild oats was an early marriage at age 20. No drugs, darn little rock and roll. Not only did I never break the law, I never even bent it. I made it through the blur that is raising five children, finally seeing daylight as they began to leave for college. I never saw August 2005 coming. But it was the perfect storm, looking back. Menopause, my elderly ailing mother living with us, my 16-year-old daughter leaving for a year as an exchange student in Thailand. Money was tight. I was having a hard time sleeping. I was very irritable and revved up. Often, my crankiness would suddenly give way to euphoria, pure joy and excitement. I would sail around the house, singing and laughing and looking for the next big project to tackle. And then, just as rapidly, I would crash again. I had taken up two new occupations, binge shopping and profanity. When I wasn't hiding the shoeboxes filled with $200 heels from Bloomingdale's, I was throwing curse words around like confetti at everybody. Sometimes, when I was caught red-handed with yet another impulse purchase, I would use the offense as defense move and cut my accuser to the quick with my nastiness until he or she just gave up and left me alone. As the months passed, I rode my roller coaster of crazy, hanging on for dear life. Guests from Asia, Europe, and Africa for Thanksgiving dinner? Sure. I slaved over making foods from all their native lands. Zakushka from Romania, Fufu from Cameroon, plus making the turkey and the trimmings. At work, I prepared to lead our church's annual high school mission trip, chaperone 40 teenagers for a week in Alaska. Why the hell not? <laughs> Though I would often close my office door and cry, the manic highs felt so great that they canceled out my sadness. I was in love with everyone and everything until I wasn't. I took to wearing earbuds all day, listening to loud pop music on an iPod, drowning out the noise around me. I felt and I acted like a teenager, mentally going back in time, maybe in hopes that things might work out if I did it all again. Finally, in late spring, a friend who is here gently confronted me about my bizarre behavior. I was furious with her, but I did call the therapist she had recommended. By then, I was unable to effectively work, incapable of being a good parent or a loving child to my mom or spouse to my husband. I recall my simmering anger during my first sessions with the therapist and with the psychiatrist she recommended. I still rebelled against the notion that I was sick although I had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I resented talking about my problems and taking pills. It didn't help that one med did nothing but make me thirsty, and another one almost made me psychotic. Eventually, I found another psychiatrist who was wonderful with both talk therapy and meds. This combination has continued to work for me for the past 12 years. Now that I am back, to whatever normal is, I have many regrets, even though I know it wasn't my fault. I will always remember the stricken faces of my husband and kids during my tirades. It took a long time for our budget to recover from my wild spending sprees. 
I can't undo what I did or unsay what I said. But I saw such love and grace during that hellish year given lavishly by people who still cared about me. Tenderness, patience, forgiveness. And now I know my mission for however much time I have left to share that kindness with other strugglers and sufferers, to tell my story openly and give them permission to tell theirs. I may no longer be that good girl, but maybe, just maybe, I'm becoming something better.